and welcome. My name is Neil Isaacs. This is the Small Business Sales Series. I'm excited to have a Stephen Fultenberg, who I will introduce momentarily. Um, should be a action-packed 30 to 40 minutes. I got a little bit of housekeeping, and then I'll introduce our guest, and, and we'll get started. So, if you are logged in, I see we've got people streaming in. You know, I, I like to joke, if you're here for the advanced air guitar class, it's down the hall and to the left. But if you're here for the small business sales series, you are in the right Zoom room. Now, you'll notice this is a, a webinar. This is not a meeting. So your camera is, is turned off. Your microphone is turned off. I see some of you in here, so I know we need to turn off the microphones. But well, your chat is enabled. I'm watching the chat. You can send questions at any time. I'll be monitoring the chat. Um, Steven and I were just talking about if this turned into a Q&A, that would be great. So we encourage your questions. There will also be a survey at the end. And uh, yes, I will be recording this. We always get that question. And yes, it will be recorded. We're recording now. So that's all you really need to know about this. I also like to set this up and saying, you know, who is this for? And I'll I'll introduce the small business sales series momentarily, but this entire sales series is for two audiences. It is for business owners, but it's also for advisors of business owners. So if you fit into either of those categories, you're in the right place. All righty then, I'm gonna go ahead and share a few slides. Let me just stand this up here. What is the small business sales series? This is a a series of webinars. I'm, I'm kind of a webinar machine. I do webinars almost every Friday. I speak to real estate agents. I speak to financial advisors. I speak to accounting professionals. And that's just me sharing my experiences from talking with our mutual clients and sharing what I've learned. But this presentation, which I do on the third Friday of each month, I call this the advisor series. It's the, a part of the small business sales series. But this is where I bring on somebody smart and we go deep on some topic related to business sales, or it could just be running a business in preparation for a sale. So that's what the Small Business Sales Series is. Those of you who have joined us today are, are here for the interview with Stephen Fultenberg. I'm really excited to bring Stephen on. I'll introduce him momentarily. If you don't know me, my name is Neil Isaacs. I do have an alphabet soup behind my name. I am the managing partner and intermediary at VR Business Brokers of the Triangle. I am a past president of the Carolina Virginia Business Brokers Association. I run a, a Facebook group called the Triangle Business Owners and I'm the husband of Vivian and the father of Avery. Quickly about VR Business Brokers, VR has sold more businesses in the world than anyone. It was started in 1979. We've had an office here in the Triangle since the 80s. And my local mantra is we care because we've been there. I am a I like to say a former small business owner, but I'm, I'm still a small business owner, but I have been on the other side of the desk, so I know how important transactions are. And, and I do have an office in North Raleigh where we have these, these private, private meetings with clients when needed. But enough about me. Those of you who have joined us today, joined us to, to hear from Stephen Fultenberg. So Stephen has been a CPA for over 30 years. He, in addition to being a CPA, he's also a certified valuation analyst and has been for more than eight years. He does tax consulting, tax planning, tax return preparation. He's personally done some, some work for me. I've, I've hired Stephen to do some work that was out of the ordinary type stuff. I know he knows his stuff. He serves small to medium sized business owners and individuals. His expertise is in valuing businesses, especially for the purchase and sale transactions is just how we do a lot of work together. But he also does gift and estate matters and in divorce situations. We're going to touch on valuations. And I will tell you, as soon as I hear divorce, as, a, as somebody who needs something, I immediately send them to Stephen. So different types of valuations for different, different purposes. He does handle divorce situations when it comes to that type of stuff. But on a personal level, he came from New York where he was part of a 30 person CPA firm and they did big, big numbers. And so with that, I'm actually gonna minimize my screen here. I'm gonna welcome Stephen Fultenberg to the Small Business Sales Series. Welcome Stephen, how are you today? Thank you, Neil, doing well. 
you know, it's actually quadruple witching day on the market. So you picked a heck of a day. <laughs> quadruple witching day. I did not know that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, it's it's all coming together. Here we are. Um, did I butcher your introduction? Did did uh, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think you did a pretty good okay. job of doing the intro. Thank you. Well, you're a interesting guy to 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 introduce. So it's it's my pleasure to have you here. I'm really excited about our conversation, and um, you know, I just want to kind of I'm gonna I'm gonna read through a few questions here that we've pre-planned, but I want I want to encourage the audience. You can you can put questions in the chat at any time. Um, so if, if Steven says something that, that piques your fancy, ask him about it and we'll, we'll address your questions. But let's just start with a basic question. You know, with both you and I, you serve individuals, you serve business owners, I serve business owners, and they're at different stages in their business. But ultimately, some of them are going to end up selling a business or just want to know what it's worth. Can you talk about the benefits of some of them want to do it their own? But what, why would somebody hire a CPA? Why would somebody utilize the services of someone like you? Well, uh, like business owner knows his or her own business well, and uh, they kind of you know stick with within those areas. CPAs, of course, are specialized to helping tax, and the goal would be to maximize cash in pocket uh, by considering all the various tax implications of a sale. Sometimes it might be the timing. Sometimes it might be the allocation of, of a price. Um, there might be hopefully a plan in place to sell well in advance so that things don't just come up out of, out of need. But uh, having a CPA in place helps the owner, if they're selling, uh, maximize you know, cash in pocket when, when the deal is done. Mm -hmm. And so it's not always what you get, it's what you, it's what you keep. That's what I have conversations with with clients about as well. And, and I tell them all the time, okay, you're going to make a million bucks on this tail. And they're like, well, how much do I keep? And I, I always say, well, I can't answer that. I'm not a CPA. You have to talk to your, to your CPA. Um, but it's, it's often more complicated than that, than just, you know, um, how much you're going to keep. Because there's a lot of different issues that go into this on a sale. Um, as an example, like I know you and I had a, were working on this one opportunity one time. and and um, at one point, you realized that this gentleman was married, and that changed everything. So, I mean, let's talk about what happens when there's other family members involved in, in a sale, and how does that affect kind of the basis or your approach to these types of opportunities? Well, it, it affects in a couple different ways. One is if you've got multiple parties involved, they may have their own agenda. So it may not only be this is what they're hoping to accomplish, uh, in selling the business, but uh, each of them may have their own tax implications as well. So, you know, most businesses are passed through entities, which means that each owner's pro rata share of profit or loss actually gets passed through and shown on their own personal tax return. Um, so in order to figure out what the implications will be, you kind of have to figure out what each person's tax situation is like. What will the tax rates be that apply to the sale? Um, what's again the allocation of that sale? It might be something that comes through um, as ordinary income. It might come through as capital gain. Uh, for some people, it could land them in a different tax rate situation. So you have to kind of explore uh, each owner's agenda. What are they trying to accomplish? Sometimes cash, you know, and pocket is most uh, beneficial for them. Sometimes. When I'm helping with evaluation, the owner says, listen, I'm willing to sacrifice the price a little bit, but I wanna make sure that all of the employees are, are maintained by the buyer. So uh, sometimes it's tangible, sometimes it's intangible. But uh, you know, if you're looking at the tax side of things, you have to kind of follow it all the way through to the individual return and see what uh, impact it might have. You know, all, all of a sudden having this income on a return, perhaps, uh, this allows the ability to take certain tax credits. Mm -hmm. uh, it obviously, it kicks them into higher tax brackets, perhaps. Uh, yeah. So the timing of when things happen, uh, as well as how the allocation of a particular sales price uh, gets passed through, you know, those are all important factors. And, and there are and, others as well. And that's an interesting point, because part of the reason I can't tell them 
you know, what they're going to keep because I'm not an accountant, but I don't know what they're going to do after they sell their business. And you mentioned the tax bracket. Like I've had people say, well, it's better if we don't sell this year because I'm going to, after I sell this, I'm not going to work. And so I want this to be sold like first of next year, because I've already made this much money this year. If you add the proceeds of the sale on top of that, now I'm in a different tax bracket. So I think this speaks to kind of this holistic view that that you're bringing like let's let's consider all the different circumstances when we when we do this type of analysis yeah you know if someone is later in life and they're retiring uh it's it's possible and in retirement their income will be lower so their ability to take on a gain uh, or ordinary income related to the sale or other things might not be as tax disadvantageous mm -hmm. uh, but other things do happen as a result you know when Older folks, of course, may be collecting Social Security. Will more Social Security now become taxable as a result of having more income? Again, will certain tax credits go away? So, mm -hmm. it, you know, when you talk with uh, owners about selling, uh, the thought is, you know, what what can I save in the way of tax now? But you know, in a way that can be a little short sighted. Yeah. The goal is to look at what your tax implications will be over the long haul. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially if you're collecting. As a seller, you may be collecting on a note, may not get all your cash at close. So you might be selling and collecting over three years or five years. So, you know, how does that impact you over, over those multiple years and not just now? So, you know, th that's, again, an important factor. Well, I'm so glad you mentioned that and you brought that up because as an intermediary, when I talk with owners about what success looks like to them, the default position, if they haven't talked with the their CPA is often, well, obviously I need to get paid all in closing. That's best for me. Um, but we have to prod a little bit and say, well, what are you going to do with that money? And um, is, is that the best thing for you? Have you talked to your CPA about how many, how much taxes you'd pay on that? Could an installment sale be a benefit? So um, I think this kind of gets to the seller team approach of, I can't give them tax advice, but I know there are, there are reasons why they're, they're uh, installment sale or seller financing type deal could be beneficial and then professionals like you can can help to play out those different circumstances and you opened up this other avenue of, of conversation about deal structure allocation of purchase price uh, we're not we're not selling widgets here these these are complicated transactions and some of the items that people are buying are taxed at different rates right so can you speak a little bit this notion of I think a lot of a lot of people are not familiar with asset allocation, goodwill versus fixed assets. Can you speak a little bit about about that topic? Right. So, whether it's the tax side or the valuation side of what I'm doing, generally the consideration is is the transaction going to be a stock sale or is it going to be an asset sale? So, is the owner selling his or her stock, walking away? Um, with all assets, liabilities, even hidden liabilities being transferred to the owner? Or uh, is it going to be a transaction where certain assets are sold? Uh, maybe certain liabilities like trade payables perhaps go along with it, payroll taxes and things of that nature, but nothing else. So uh, the implications are different depending on whether you're the sell side or the buy side. You know, if you're on the seller side and, and selling the stock of your company, it's just like if you'd sold, you know, your, your stock in IBM or Google or whatever, you've got, you know, long-term capital gains potentially. Um, on an asset sale, it's really happening internally. It's happening by the business. And, and what's happening is you're now selling, say, inventory. You're selling fixed assets. You're selling, as you mentioned, uh, goodwill or other intangibles. So what, what happens in that case, it, you know, in an asset sale, uh, you have to specifically allocate the purchase price. Uh, you know, the buyer needs to know that. Uh, you need to know that because how certain things are, are, are treated and handled as far as the allocation of proceeds will, will dictate the tax implications. So for instance, um, if you sold inventory, chances are you're going to sell inventory for what it's worth on the balance sheet. So mm -hmm. it's going to come off. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's ordinary income. You, you purchased inventory, you now sold it. Uh, if you sell fixed assets as part of a transaction, uh, it might be capital gain in nature, but what's probably going to happen is if you took accelerated depreciation while you own those assets, 
and now you have a gain on selling them, there might be what's known as recapture. Mm -hmm. So that depreciation deduction that you've got earlier on, now that you've got a gain on it, that recapture depreciation is ordinary income. Um, and then the last piece are the intangibles. So when you're selling in intangibles, you know, that's, all, that's treated like long-term capital gain. Now just think about it from the buyer side. The buyer wants to be able to, to get the quickest deduction for you know, the, the price allocation. So inventory is better for the buyer because it can be an immediate deduction. They, they put inventory in, into production and they can immediately get the deduction for it. So that's good for them. Whereas when they buy fixed assets, they, they'll have to depreciate it over three years, five years, seven years, whatever. So it's kind of an intermediate life. Again, the seller has capital gain or ordinary income associated with that. And the last piece is the goodwill. Typically the biggest part of a transaction. Again, the seller treats goodwill as a capital gain. The buyer, which is the, the most favorable treatment, the buyer treats goodwill um, as an asset that has to be amortized over 15 years. So that's a long-term uh, asset. It takes a, a while to recoup what you've, what you've uh, purchased. Mm -hmm. So the, the seller and the buyer are in direct, you know, adversarial, so to speak, relation as to how they want to allocate that price. So the seller wants the best tax implications. The buyer wants to get the quickest deduction. And they yeah. usually do not coincide. So... Well that, that was a lot of good, good information. I want to kind of tell you what I heard. I took some notes here. So this idea, okay, we're going to sell our business. Maybe it's a million, maybe it's 10 million. Great. We have, we have a deal. No, we don't have a deal. This is something that I, I think is really interesting about deal making is hopefully you get all these terms up, up at the front when you're making a deal with a buyer or a seller, but the buyer and seller are diametrically opposed in a lot of these things and about favorable tax treatment. And I heard you say they want, different things out of this. They want the, the things classified differently in, in ways that best benefit them. So that's why each side kind of needs a great CPA and a great tax advisor to help them with this stuff. Things are taxed differently if it's, if it's tangible, if it's intangible, and you, you broke those down even further. And then this notion of goodwill, I think the majority of business owners, when they hear goodwill, they think, well, this place is worth something because I work so hard. And they have this different concept of goodwill than you might when you're talking about taxes. But goodwill is definitely a measurable, a measurable factor. Is that, would you agree with those, those assets, with those assertions? Yeah, well, uh, probably what you find as well is most business owners think their businesses are worth more than they actually are. Um, oh, that never happened. <laughs> and... Um, but you know, intangibles encompass a lot of things. Yeah. Um, it's it, yes, it is the product of effort and sweat and and you know time invested in a business over many years. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but goodwill really is what it means from an arithmetic standpoint is what is the value of a business above the actual book value of its assets and liabilities. So if a business is worth, you know, a million dollars and the actual assets, less liabilities on the books are 200,000, mm -hmm. then you've got $800,000 of goodwill. So it is kind of an arithmetic uh, thing, but goodwill is, is, it's not something of course that you're touching and, and seeing, although it could consist or correlate to things like phone numbers and customer lists and um, logos and, and other things. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, good goodwill is is a huge component, um, harder to measure, and that's why you typically bringing in someone like yourself, um, you know, on the sell side of things, or someone like myself for valuations related to other type of transactions. Yeah, when I'm explaining it to, to owners in the most simplistic way, I, I will say, you know, your goodwill is what what people are going to pay above what the the tangible assets are worth. Um, and people tend to understand it when you explain it like that. We could do a fire sale and just get rid of all these tables and chairs and vehicles, but your business is worth more than that because of the phone number, because you make money. Um, but, but once we're negotiating a, an asset allocation, now we're really dialing what those in, the, what, what those individual assets are, or what those classifications are. The other thing that you mentioned was about recapture, and that is certainly something that I did not know much about earlier in my career but i've learned i've learned that it's extremely important 
and that there are a lot of ways that as you're operating a business, you can save money on taxes and uh, maybe depreciate faster than, than the, the traditional schedule, straight line or, or, or what have you. But in the event that you're going to sell your business and, and in this, you may have to pay some of that, that back. It may go the, the wrong way as far as uh, maximum proceeds of a sale. I think a lot of people are not aware about depreciation recapture. Um, yeah, what's happening is the IRS allows you to take really aggressive depreciation. Uh, when you buy something, you know, right now uh, you can immediately expense anything on a unit basis that's $2,500 or less. So if you buy a desk that's $1,500, or you buy a laptop that's two grand, if you change windows in a rental unit that are $1,000 a piece, each of those things can immediately be expensed. Uh, that's not what we're talking about, although those yeah. are great deductions. What we're talking about is, you know, things that are above those $2,500 thresholds where you have to, uh, you know, set it up under some form of depreciation. And you might get immediate right off even under depreciation. Other things are again, are going to be five years, seven years, uh, whatever. But because you've taken these accelerated methods of depreciation, you've gotten a deduction on your personal tax return that lowered your ordinary income. The IRS says at a later date, when you sell these things, if you have a gain on selling these particular items that you got an ordinary deduction originally, then you have to actually pick up part of that gain as now ordinary income at a later time. So mm -hmm. part of the gain is broken out. Some might be capital, but to the extent you had an ordinary deduction from taking that accelerated depreciation early, you've got what's known as depreciation recapture. You'll have ordinary income now um, as part of that gain. So you have to kind of think through, uh, you know, is it better for you to necessarily take accelerated uh, depreciation methods? Um, usually it is, but if you're contemplating a sale in a year or two, it may or may not. Uh, your ordinary income uh, tax situation one year might be substantially higher or lower than what it's going to be in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So are you better off taking the, the accelerated deduction now or, you know, this year where the tax rate is more or less favorable, or are you better off having perhaps a lower gain because you took less depreciation? So you have to think through. Now, if there's no contemplation of sale at all in the foreseeable future, I'm generally gonna uh, advise my clients to take the accelerated methods of depreciation. Yes. Uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna be more beneficial for them. You just, you just don't know when it's going to potentially come back as a recapture. Uh, and you don't know what the tax rules will be at, at that point. Now, here we are on potentially the precipice of changing tax rates uh, for higher income earners, whether it be ordinary income, or capital gains income. So it becomes a little trickier. Uh, also, there are a lot of tax laws that will sunset at the end of 2025. So how do, how do those changes fit in? So ordinarily, um, it's, it's kind of a slam dunk to take the accelerated depreciation when you can, um, immediate uh, immediate bonus uh, depreciation or what's called section 179 or using the standard charts for accelerated methods. But you know, if you're approaching a sale, it may or may not make sense to do that. Um, you have to, again, think through how will I be now versus how will I be a year from now or two years from now when this turns around, when the sale happens. Well, in, in listening to you, I heard, I heard a lot of long-term strategy there and and i think this is a differentiator if someone's looking to hire a cpa are they just gonna look at the last 12 months and say oh you owe this or are they going to ask these questions what is your long-term strategy we can save you money today at the potential expense of money you could have saved in the future that's kind of what i heard you walk us through and then you introduce this idea of not knowing what the future holds because tax laws change all the time. I think that's fascinating. And I, and I know that when talk with a lot of my, my clients, business owners that are thinking about selling, they're not having these conversations with their CPAs. Sometimes I know their CPA. And when I talk to them, they say, well, I wish, I wish I'd known that they were planning to sell. We may have done things differently if I knew they were planning to exit their business. Um, so I think that speaks a lot just to, to why owners should always talk with their advisors about their long-term plans. They should, they should have a strategy and they should include their advisors. 
not just their CPA, but their financial advisor, their legal advisors. I think it's, it should be a, a, a team event, a seller team event. Um, so I think that you really highlighted some of that. Speaking, speaking of thinking long-term, another thing that I wanted to touch on is about assets. And specifically, you know, let's say I run a restaurant and I buy a, a freezer. That asset can be capitalized or it can be expensed. And, and so I want to just kind of hear your thoughts about how to treat assets when you're, when you're approaching this long-term versus short-term items, um, a treatment of items. Um, because as an intermediary, I know we, we don't want to see high expenses. We want to see profit if we're positioning for a business to be exited. But sometimes there's other tax implications. Sometimes it's better if that's capitalized and goes on the balance sheet um, for, for tax treatment. So any, any comments on just this, this idea of how assets are handled in relation to short and long-term goals? Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's never good to look at your tax situation uh, in just the current year. Uh, you know, at a minimum, you can probably see into the next year, what will life be like? Or do you have any kind of life-changing events that are gonna be happening? Do you have a business that's ramping up? Do you have one that's shutting down? Are you reaching retirement? Are you early in your career, about to have kids? Uh, you know, so kind of where you are in your, in your tax life matters. Um, I wear two hats uh, sometimes, you know, at the same time, because I'm not only assisting on the tax side, but also looking at things from a valuation perspective. So sometimes we talked about buyer and sellers having opposing concepts of how they want things to be handled. On the tax side, of course, generally you want things deducted sooner than later, generally speaking. On the valuation side, of course, if you want to, to prop up how your business looks, you're not going to want to expense you know, every thousand or $2,000 item, um, in theory, at least you won't, uh, because what's happening there is you're, you're uh, deflating your, you know, profitability or your net, net income is lower, or perhaps it creates a loss. Yeah. Your balance sheet doesn't look as healthy. So from a valuation perspective, it's, you know, it's always better to have these assets on the balance sheet and depreciate them slowly mm -hmm. and not impact your P&L. But again, that's, in complete contradiction to what you might want to do from a tax perspective. So you walk a balancing act between the two. Um, as an owner, you know, if you, if you see in the horizon that you're going to be selling your business, you might want to slow down some of the things that you've historically been deducting aggressively in terms of depreciation, because you want your business to have the most favorable light in terms of financial reports that are given out. Um, you know, so buyer looking at uh, financial information will, you know, they may see through what's been expensed, but, uh, you know, the stronger you can portray your business, the better. So it might be worth sacrificing some of the tax savings as you approach selling uh, so that you can have a better portrayal and ultimately a better valuation for your business. So, um, so you might want to expense that, you know, freezer equipment, you might not. Mm -hmm. uh, how soon are you going to be selling your business? If it's in the foreseeable future, it might not be in your best interest to take those aggressive depreciation methods. Yeah, I, I like everything you said. And, and the only thing I would add is it's good to, to think long term and to have this, this strategy, the tax strategy and, and how you run your business and how you your representations are and how your filings are. But it's also good to keep in mind that sometimes COVID happens. And um, sometimes plans change, and we're, we've seen that recently. Okay, well, we spent a lot of time on, on these questions about, you know, why to work with a CPA and, and how your current situation affects basically about planning, long-term versus short-term planning. I want to pivot just a little bit. We're at the 30-minute mark, so um, I want to encourage everyone to ask questions, and if you have questions, put them in the chat. But I also want to, I also want to pivot a little bit to talk about valuation. So as an intermediary in seeking to represent owners who want to sell a business, I do broker's opinion of value. It's not a USPAP certified valuation, but it helps me get in touch with what a, a most probable sales price is. And you do calculation or conclusion of value. Can you speak to 
and, and what we offer is complimentary. And we, as I mentioned in the introduction, I I send you opportunities all the time that just aren't a good fit for me. Can you speak a little bit to just what what evaluation is supposed to accomplish, and maybe what type of how not all valuations are the same? Yeah. So uh, you mentioned con uh, conclusions of value and calculations of value. Sometimes uh, a, a business owner will come to me and say you know, listen, I just want you to figure out what my business is worth under the following assumptions. So just, you know, look at my cash flow, figure out the values. Here's the assumptions to use. And they kind of set the parameters, set the framework. Um, so in for, for professional business valuation analysts, you know, that's a, that's a calculation engagement. It's just terminology. Um, whereas a conclusion of value related to a conclusion engagement is, I make, it's all up to me. I make the judgment call as to what methods and approaches to use, what assumptions to apply. Um, of course, I go through the risk analysis, look at financial reports, et cetera. So that's a conclusion. Um, you know, it's probably more in line with what you do. Uh, you make certain assumptions. Um, you know, you're applying uh, the financial information that you've gathered to figure out what a business is worth for sale. Um, Mine isn't always for sale purposes. And, and as a result, um, some of the assumptions that are used to value may be different. Uh, my goal isn't always what is a business for sale, uh, for sale purposes. It could be for tax purposes. And, uh, you know, so if, you're, if you've done or are planning on doing a gift of your business to a trust, if you're doing a partial gift, so you want to give, say, 20% of your business to a trust or giving it to your kids, um, then the IRS has particular methodology that you know, it wants you to use. It assumes that there's a hypothetical buyer and therefore you know, I'll, I'll take certain discounting, I'll, I'll, I'll do certain approaches and methodologies. Whereas um, if someone comes to me kind of like you know, to you and says, you know, I, I wanna get a sense of what my business is worth because I'm contemplating a sale. Well, are you selling 100% of your business? Uh, and when which case, you know, I'll take one uh, approach to it. Are you selling only part of your business? Um, which again, might mean certain discounting. Um, it goes back to control, really. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're selling your business, you've got complete control over it. Yeah. If you're selling part of it to someone else, uh, um, will they have control? Essentially, it is... is you know, where things um, cut off as far as control or not control. And each, uh, it's a 50-50 situation. You have what's known as blocking rights. So you can block something from happening, but you can't force it to happen. If you've got more than 50%, you've got control. If you're less than 50%, you have what's known as a minority interest. So that lack of control uh, means that that, percentage of business that you own is actually worth less. That lack of control means that um, I'll take a discount for that. So, yeah. you know, when you do a broker's opinion of value, you're valuing 100% of the business. I may be valuing a partial interest where certain discounts and other things come into play. Um, yeah. And again, for IRS purposes, I may take a slightly different approach because they suggest certain methods be used or certain approaches be done. So purpose doesn't matter. Yeah, no, I think that's that's huge. Um, if you don't have a hundred percent control of your business, then it's going to affect the value. And I think you'll find most intermediaries like myself that are looking to take it to the open market and sell it. If if there's if you don't have complete control, that's going to be one of the first reasons I'm going to refer you to a, a Stephen Fultonberg. And then also, if there's contention, if we can't, if both parties, if maybe there are multiple people but not everybody wants to sell. That's another reason why. And then to your point, maybe they don't even want to sell at all. Maybe owners want a valuation, but not for the purpose of selling. Maybe it is for uh, tax reasons. These are all great reasons to, to hire a, a CVA like Stephen. Not all valuations are the same. I think, I think you made some salient points there. Or We're getting some questions from the audience. Um, can you speak to tax benefits? for employing veterans. Are there tax benefits to employing veterans in a, in a small business? 
Yeah, there, there are actually tax credits to, to uh, hiring uh, veterans. There are tax credits. Um, they're rare, but there have been tax credits to hiring um, those who ha have, I guess, criminal backgrounds. So the, I, there are a lot of different credits available. Um, and, uh, you know, keeping track of the changes from year to year can be difficult. Uh, they change. Some of them are based on, um, you know, income levels, um, whether you're a small business, uh, and by definition, you know, there's small business means something that was historically 10 million or, or less in annual gross receipts. Now it's now 25 million, uh, but tax credits are available uh, for a lot of different things. There's a lot of payroll tax credits out there, but yes, incentives to hire um, certain class workers, uh, there are several of those. Thank you for that. So we got another question in about, you know, what if these business owners want to sell within the next six months? And how do you coach a business owner to, to add more value if they're thinking about selling? And I'll, I'll take a stab at this one. It's pretty common for me to have conversations with owners and the value is not what they want it to be. So through the process of evaluation and looking at what the earnings are and hearing what they want it to be valued at, I will usually share with them what their peers are selling for. You know, owners who got this much in consideration, they typically earned this much. So how can you work with your CPA or a business coach or, or another advisor to get your business in, in the condition that you want it to in, in the next six months? So that's my yeah, answer. I'll, Any comments on that, Stephen? Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. So um, a lot of owners, I, I guess, take some flexibility in what they use their business for, meaning they may have some personal expenses running through the business. Sometimes they have family members on payroll that aren't actually working, or maybe they're not earning what they're being paid. Um, and it's, you know, I come in and one of the first things that I say to owners who, who aren't clients of mine uh, is, you know, it's best for you to be forthcoming about these things or else I'm not going to value your business well. But uh, in advance of sale, whether it's six months or a year or further, I'll, I'll advise them, have as clean a set of books as possible. You know, stop running your personal expenses through the business. Stop doing these other things. Um, get your books as clean as possible. And that does two things. First of all, it, it uh, portrays your business in the best light. Um, so your bottom line presumably will be that much better because you don't have these expenses or other things running through the P&L. But also from a buyer's perspective, um, if you have, excuse me, from a buyer's perspective, if you have a clean set of books and the numbers are solid going back the last few years, it eliminates some of what I'll call financial risk. So if I'm a buyer uh, or a seller, um, business is valued based on its ability to generate cash flow and risk. And one of the risks is the availability and reliability of financial information. So if I'm buying into a business and I have a little bit of doubt as to the reliability of financial information, that means the risk is going to be a little higher and going to be willing to pay a little less. Mm -hmm. So you can actually not only, you know, make the business look a little better, but it comes through in terms of value if you have a nice clean set of financial information that is given to a buyer. Extremely, extremely important point. You know, a lot of times owners open their business, they pay a lot of attention to setting up their books. And it's one of the first things they let go once they get busy is keeping good books and records and having transparent accounting procedures so that anyone can can see how they make their money. But when it's time to sell, it matters a lot. And you use the term discounting, 100%. Owners do, who don't have, we'll call it clean books, but I just say, you know, we have a lot of discretionary earnings and some of them are hard to find. 100%, that's going to hurt the value of the business. So th those are some great points. Um, I, I want to take just one or two more questions and then we'll wrap things up. There's a question about how employees come into play. So when you're valuing a business, the sale price of a company, what does it matter if they're full-time, if they're part-time, maybe if they have benefits, you know, are you paying taxes on them? Can you speak, can you speak to that, Stephen?
Uh, yeah, it's actually an extremely important point. Uh, normally, as part of the evaluation process, I'll ask who are the key employees. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to go off of video for a moment. Uh, hopefully, that'll be a little better audio. Yeah. Um, I'll ask who are the key employees? How do they? How much experience do they have? Um, I'll ask, uh, you know, how are their comps and bennies compared to comp competition of the marketplace? Um, I'll ask, you know, what is their health? Uh, are they planning on retiring? Uh, I'll ask a whole series of questions related to the employees because if I'm a buyer coming in, I want to know that the workforce is going to be stable. And if people are considering looking elsewhere, um, if they're not being paid, uh, well, an event like a change in ownership may be the kick in the behind that they decide I'm going to go, go somewhere else. So I'll focus heavily on who are the employees and all of those you know, intangible items, uh, but also again, comparing comp and Benny's to the market. So uh, that, is, that is definitely something I consider. And again, I, I, I mentioned at the outset of this, some people when selling a business, they want to make sure that their workforce is, is kept in place because they've devoted so many years to the business. They wanna make sure that their employees are uh, you know, paid well and, and, and kept on for some period of time. So it's, a, it's critical, not only from the seller side, but the buyer side. I, I couldn't agree more. I like to say that the three P's of, of a marketable business are profit. If it doesn't make money, it's hard to sell. Processes, which is you got to have figure out what the secret sauce is. And the third P is people. If you don't have a team, if you're doing it all yourself, if your team is not adequately compensated, you know, anybody can, can build that. It's hard to build a team. So very, very important point. Well, the, the, I'll go out on this question. This was a really good question that came in. You mentioned tax laws change all the time. For those owners who are watching now, um, you know, here we are mid-June of 2021. What tax change of, of 2021 do you think will affect business owners the most? Well, um, there hasn't been a whole lot of business change this year. Uh, you know, there's been a continuation of some of the payroll tax credits as far as bringing workers back or maintaining them. Um, I, there's been more change so far on the individual tax side, but uh, I think one thing that uh, business owners really appreciate is that the, the meals deduction is now 100%. Um, as, as long as you meet the criteria, it has to be from a restaurant, has to have the business purpose. You know, Some of the other rules that were in place before are still in place. Um, so, uh, I think maybe one of the things for those who are out trying to drum up business or develop their business that might just simply be that meals deduction. I yeah. think the, the, bigger, the bigger changes are probably on the horizon with the individual tax rate changes potentially happening, um, capital gains rates uh, changing, gift and estate um, limits probably being reduced from $11.7 million uh, per person. So right now, if you, if, during your life or upon your death as an individual, you can give away tax-free $11.7 million of assets. Uh, that's a lot. And if you don't give all of that away during your life or upon your death, then your spouse can use what you don't. That's called portability. So in theory, you can give away you know, $23.5 million worth. Um, that's grown quite a bit over the number of years. It's gone from a million to three to five, and then double to 10. And now it's indexed for inflation, it's 11.7 million. My guess is that you know it's going to drop. Uh, the government's looking to close, you know, its budget deficits. It will probably drop to some extent. I don't know to what level. Um, so what you can give away again in your life or upon your death is probably going to drop. Uh, that will create all sorts of tax planning maneuvers, setting up trusts, more gifting of of interests during your life. Um, you know, if you give part of your business away early on in its life. Uh, at, the t at that time, it may be valued much less than what it would be like five or 10 years down the line. So, you know, the, the piece of your lifetime uh, gift is a much smaller bite by gifting earlier on in, as a business owner. So if we drop down to, say, $5 million as a lifetime gift or upon death exemption, um, there's going to be a lot of people scurrying to figure out how do I avoid a taxable estate? Uh, and the second part of that is, if you pass away, 
um, and give your business or part of it to you know, other family members, um, they have what's known as a step up in basis, which means that whatever is worth when you pass away is what uh, it becomes in their hands as if they paid for it. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's a step up in basis. And there's, there's discussion, whether it goes through, that that step up concept um, might be eliminated. So not only will the lifetime exemption drop quite a bit, but the step up might go away. Um, so as a result, there's, there's probably going to be a wave of gifting, trusts being established, uh, things of that nature, like there was a handful of years ago when there was a threat of the exemption dropping from five to three million, but it didn't happen, or from three to one million, I forget. So uh, I think the bigger changes are on the horizon as far mm-hmm. as these tax rate changes yeah. and the uh, exemptions uh, and the step up in basis. Well, I think um, individuals are to businesses what pedestrians are to, to automobile drivers, right? We're all individuals, um, whether we're business owners or not. So those changes affecting individuals will certainly affect us as business owners as well. Well, I thought I think that's a, a great point to start to 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 wrap things up with. I put your information on this on the screen here, Stephen, so you can. You've got his phone number, FultonbergCPA.com is, is all things for Stevens company. Uh, I want to thank you so much for your time and your knowledge that you shared with us today. I thought, I thought we covered some really good topics. And it's, if, if nothing else, owners should think about asking their advisors some of these topics that we talked about. Because long-term planning was a, a topic that we touched on and talked about a lot of important things that owners should, should be considering. I appreciate um, you having me on. And, you know, if there was anyone who asked a question that wasn't answered or uh, held back on asking anything, uh, certainly feel free to reach out to me. Um, I answer calls all the time, um, as whether it's as, as favors to individuals, uh, pro bono work, whatever. So uh, I have no issue at all in answering questions. Hopefully I can, you know, get the answers that you need. As, yeah. as business owners or as other professionals who are just interested in learning more. I can attest to that. You've been a tremendous help to me and, and, a, and a lot of our clients that we worked on through our team. And, and so definitely give Stephen a call if you have questions and you will get value even before you hire him. Well, I want to wrap things up just by saying that uh, we've got some more webinars coming up. I do a, a webinar for accounting professionals. That's going to be my next weekly webinar. And then a month from now, I'll be interviewing David Hellinger with LPL Financial Advisors. And we're going to talk about what owners should know in financial planning in advance of the sale of a business. So that'll be July 16th at noon. I hope you can join us for that. All of these registrations are at raleighbusinessbroker.com slash webinars. So tons of opportunity there. You will get a survey after, after we close this out. So the last thing I'll leave on, thank you guys so much for tuning in today. I hope it's self-evident that that I'd love to partner with other advisors. That's what this content is about. How can we help our mutual clients? My information's on the screen here. RaleighBusinessBroker.com is the best place to find information about me, as well as my YouTube page. This will be on my YouTube page shortly. And with that, I will minimize this screen. I'll thank you again once more, Stephen. On behalf of Stephen Fultonberg, this is Neil Isaacs with VR Business Brokers, sayonara.